So uh, thank you very much for joining. I'm Itamar Friedman, the CEO and co-founder of Coding AI. And I'm here to share with from our experience, how can you exploit AI to introduce aut automatic or semi-automatic software development processes, workflows in your organizations. It could be as a single developer, it could be as a busy and professional team in an enterprise. Okay, we're going to talk about six ways to exploit AI to develop faster with less issues and bugs. It's going to be divided roughly into 30 minutes more sharing our view of the future, the near future, the far future, giving some insight about LLMs and how they perform with a coding uh, related task, as well as showing concrete six ways to exploit AI. Uh, of course, it's easier and more feasible for me uh, to show those examples uh, with Codium AI tools, but actually you can find a few, not, not for all flows, but for some of them, you can try to build yourself or use some other tools. I'm gonna to talk about that at the end, okay? So that's what we're going to, to cover. Uh, great. So let's start with uh, building some, you know, mutual terminology that we understand each other. Uh, let's start with discussing how software development processes look these days. I'll, I'll call it Gen 1.0. I believe what we're seeing right now is the classical software development pipeline process. It's called the V, uh, you know, software development process. It, usually we start with writing some specification. Uh, sometimes we're lazy. We're just writing a few lines or, I don't know, one uh, dev uh, ticket, uh, dev task ticket in, in Jira or so. And then we're running to do our, the implementation because we have to, right? This is what we need to finish at the end of the sprint uh, with the implementation. And if we have time, then we're also writing tests. So in, on the X axis, you can see the time and on the Y axis, you can see the executability, right? Spec is not executable at the moment. We'll talk about that implementation is and test is somewhere in the middle. Now, Gen 2.0, as came and already existing today uh, with, for example, the introduction of Copilot uh, from GitHub, which is basically an assistant that helps you work inside your ID and write more lines of code or accomplish more lines of code being generated by AI. And then there is Codium AI, and we're gonna talk about it. We have various tools, but one of our tools is basically a testing assistant also inside ID, helping you generate test suites from different kind. So that Gen 2.0, um, helping us um, still performing the same classical software development pipeline, but just doing that a bit more productive. Uh, we can claim if it's a lot more productive, a bit more productive, even 15%, 30% uh, could be quite, quite a lot. But what I'm trying actually to say here that I don't think that we saw yet a paradigm shift in software development. Uh, yes, with Codium AI, for example, you can generate better tests, higher, higher quality, but 30% improvement, I don't think yet it's a full uh, paradigm shift that we saw, for example, with the introduction of the cloud, in my opinion. Now, before we're going to talk about Gen 3.0, uh, let's introduce another uh, development pipeline, test-driven development. I'm sure like most of you, if not all of you, are already very uh, familiar with it. Um, basically, I would say that probably most of us would think that this is maybe an ideal way to develop, but actually very practical to do. Uh, what it meant, to, I would say, put it simple in a simple world, words, it's mainly talking about starting with writing your specification, perhaps even elaborating more than usual, and then generating, uh, sorry, creating tests, writing tests. Uh, they should be quite elaborated and then moving, and by the way, all of them would probably fail with missing implementation and then moving to the implementation. Notice that the time axis disappeared and now the arrows are actually presenting how we are developing a long time. The executability is still is still the same, okay? So TDD, test-driven development, start with specs, move to tests, then implementation. I'm, I'm a bit simplifying because basically we can iterate over it. You can write some of the specs, some of the tests, some implementation, and then continue with adding more tests, et cetera. The question is, uh, could AI actually help us to achieve TDD? And do we actually want AI to help us to achieve TDD? Is this the ideal uh, development pipeline that we want to uh, you know, have in three to five years from now? So 
our answer is no. We actually believe in the concept of drive by AI, which means that you can start anywhere you want. For example, writing your spec, writing your test, writing your implementation, and then AI will help you to transform from one media, from one format to another. Notice the very big difference from Gen 2.0 where we had assistants and now we're having like agents. The kind of the, one of the differences that I'm claiming here between agent and assistant is one is like in 2.0, basically helping you just do a bit more of what you're already doing. And while the agent helping you actually transform and perform full uh, workflows. The reason that I'm mentioning drive by AI because we all know about the don't repeat yourself from the code. Uh, aspect that we don't want to have, for example, the same exact same code or s very similar code uh, duplicated many times in our in our repos. So the same goes here. Basically, a spec that is written to the you know most detailed spec is actually code, right? If you try to write spec as detailed as code, probably it will be code. So it gives us a, a strong hint that there is some redundancy redundancy here from test spec and implementation. And that's exactly the opportunity here for AI to help us to complete. Now, the, ac ex the time axis disappeared to completely because again, we want to enable to start wherever you want, but also the executability, because if this performs perfectly, basically it's almost like saying that you can execute a specification. Now, what I present here is that there are a bunch of there is a like let's say like an agent uh, swarm uh, that all agents are 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 made equal, but actually we don't think it's going to be like that. We we think that practically in order to enable that we're going to see different agents like perform different tasks uh, because they're going to have different tools, they're going to have different guardrails, they're going to have different privileges, credentials, uh, etc. We're going to talk a bit a bit of, of that uh, in in the, in the near future. And uh, I mean, like in uh, in ten minutes or so. Uh, by the way, once in a while, I'm checking the Q and A, and if you want to ask anything, uh, I might be looking on that. Okay, great. Uh, now I'm I am going to talk a lot about agents, and uh, if you are able to count how many times I said agents, uh, you might you might uh, get a surprise at the end. Uh, now let's start by introducing agents. If I'm going to talk about it uh, uh, and mention it many times, so I'm I, I want to. Um, depict here, show here, the highest level architecture of an agent. Basically, it requires to have an interface uh, to a user, like a developer, or to another agent, because we said it could be a swarm or like orchestration of, of agents talking to each other. Then the core algorithm is, is like the main brain of, of the agent, uh, usually where we would perform like different syncing processes. We're going to talk about syncing uh, in, in a few minutes as well. And then one of the things that are you know very special for with agents that they have tools. Different agents could have different tools, and also one of the most you know unique tool could be a memory. Okay, now uh, when we're talking about a future where we're going to like orchestrate and use many agents, there could be like one super agent that's going to do everything. We don't believe in that future. Uh, maybe there is going to be a future where one agent is going to be the interface going to orchestrate many other agents or there's gonna be an agent swarm. Even in these options, there could be uh, a different, I saw the question, by the way, I'll take a look in a minute. Even in these two, last two options, even there, there are sub options. For example, if we take the super agent, there could be like that orchestrating other agents. They, it might be orchestrating similar agents or specialized agents. We believe that it's gonna look like something between super agents that is going to orchestrate specialized agent or just agent swarm with specialized agents that humans developers are going to orchestrate. Okay, this is important because it brings me back to uh, to this um, diagram. But just one minute, let's see. Could you please share uh, what is Codium doing now with respect to what you talked about? Thank you so much because I'm actually going to uh, talk about it in, um, in 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 a minute. Okay, that's I'm building up for that. Great, thank you. So. Uh, back to this point now, to this diagram, now we understand how we see the future where agents are going to help us to trans, they're going to help us, you know, they're going to be still the assistants are going to exist, okay, we're going to have assistants in that helping us with implementation, testing, even specification, I'm not sure if you're using many of these, uh, like tools that you can even try Codium or, or Codium AI or, or ChatGPT for that. 
But the special thing about agent is the transformation. What I try to uh, uh, clarify is that we think that each agent is going to look different. And that's exactly a good point to talk about Codium AI. We are building different agents for different tasks. Uh, for example, right now, you can already go to our website and uh, start playing for free, even open source, et cetera, with uh, all of the three agents and, and assistants that I'm showing here. We have the cover agent that helps you take a test suite and actually it could be very, you know, initial test suite with, I don't know, like 10, 20% uh, percent code coverage and increase it uh, to a certain, you know, a code coverage threshold that you would like. Uh, it performs like an agent. Uh, it's really cool. It's an alpha version, by the way. And we have more mature uh, tools, which is the Codimate, which is an assistant for test and implementation. And we have the peer agent that helps you at the point where you're going to merge your code to verify the quality uh, and et cetera, okay? And this is just the beginning. We're going to introduce more agents currently on our roadmap, a spec agent, an end-to-end -end agent. Uh, it's in, in the works. We're more focused on increasing the quality of these agents than it's not something that it's coming up in the next two weeks, but uh, but stay, stay tuned, okay? So uh, on one hand, we are, some extent com very complementary to tools like Copilot because we are more focused on testing and code review, et cetera, we're going to talk about it later. I'm just mentioning that because I saw some question. On the other hand, we could, with Codumate that I'm going to demo a bit later, you can also uh, uh, use it for code completion and code uh, generation. Um, but a uh, service will see something refactoring, uh, covering you like to know about the future. Great. So I'll, I, I was asked about the future of cover agent and I was asked about uh, refactoring. I'm gonna to get to that. Great. Let's start uh, already. Uh, again, this was like a very first part of how we see the future and why LLM can or cannot perform these tasks. You will judge at the end. I want uh, right now to focus on one of the agents, the PR agents, okay? That's, that's the next step. Workflow number one, highlighting, and uh, high, high, you're going in workflow number one. We are going to see how PR agent is going to highlight and review issues just before you're going to merge. You want to make sure that the code that you merge is in high quality. Let's start simple. I'm going to show you how you can use PR agent to open a pull request. Of course, you, you, you open a pull request in the regular way. PR agent is going to generate reviews with code suggestion on how to fix some of the, code, the you know, the highlight, the highlights of, of inaccuracies and, and best practices. And then you can even make sure to, uh, that you review those suggestions and mark for the reviewer later that, hey, the AI was re uh, suggesting we were reviewed and now human review can come in, okay? So let's start with that. But first, before I actually show this workflow that I just presented, and by the way, we're going to slightly complicated in, in a second, in, in a few minutes. I want to like show you like a very initial, give you a very initial understanding what peer agent in general. Um, specifically, specifically, I'm going to show you a pull request inside peer agent. So we're like dog fooding. The peer agent is reviewing uh, pull request and peer agent. And specifically, I chose one of the pull requests. Maybe it's not you know the best example for showing PR agent, but I did want to use the opportunity to tell you that now PR agent, the open source part, and soon also the self the the hosted managed service, you can choose which models you want to use. For example, we now support just from a few days ago, we were support supporting Sonat 3.5, which seems like an awesome model according to our benchmarks uh, for uh, code review and, and coding in general. Okay. So what you see here is a pull request that we opened ourselves to enable uh, uh, Sonat for PR agent. What the PR agent did, it was automatically executed to provide a, an initial description. And then also an overview, like a walkthrough for the pull request. You know that, that famous meme, which is sad and funny at the same time. I'm a, I'm a dev, let's say tech lead, and I'm going to review some pull request. If I have 40 minutes, right, for a pull request review, if the pull request includes 20 lines of code, yay, five comments for me. 20, 50 lines of code, two comments, 500 lines of code of change looks good to me, 
move on because I don't have time to actually understand that entire pull request. That's funny, but also sad. And that's one of the reasons we came up with this walkthrough that mentally helps you review properly, like enter into the pull request in a good way. Uh, like you can read what was changed in high level, high level like uh, titles, and then like you can dive uh, in with m more like breakthrough breakdown of uh, what was the actual change, and then you can jump to the code itself. Okay, so that's like one example of what you can do with PR agent. You can also get like a high level review. Uh, for example, uh, you know if uh, if there's some clear security concerns, how hard it is to review this PR. Could have this PR being, you know, break broken to additional sub PRs, etc. But what I wanted to show you, and remember what I'm talking about right now, is a flow where we're opening a pull request, getting an initial review with suggestions. What I wanted to focus on is actually on the, the command we called improve. Okay, the improve command is one of a dozen or more commands available in PR agent, and in this case, it was run automatically. And what you can see here is that the improve command, the improve command gave four issues that that uh, suggest to take a look. They were given in, in categories like possible issues and performance. And I'm going to show you uh, soon uh, how, um, just I need to hide here, one second. Hide a video, the floating meeting call. Great. So uh, I'm gonna show you soon for an example with many more categories and, uh, and a, a, quite a big list, quite a problematic PR probably. I hope uh, I'm not offending uh, anyone. Okay. And then interestingly, for each one of the suggestions, you can apply, you can see the reasoning, you can see the reasoning behind the PR and you can apply the suggestion immediately. We see like around two out of 10 pull requests actually applying directly from the suggestion and four out of pull requests actually, uh, fixing issues according to the peer agent, it could be that these fixes are done in the IDE. So half is applying, for example, roughly applying directly the suggestion and half uh, you know, from the ID. You can see here an example of a suggestion that was given and, uh, and was applied directly. And then after uh, a commit, a new suggestion are arriving, okay? So, so this, is, this is the flow that we talked about number one and two. What is approved AI suggestion review? Okay, think about it as the, you know, the reviewer of this PR. I wanna make sure that my friend that opened this PR at least took a look on the AI suggestion before I'm coming. You know, let's fix those. If, if they're good or not, you know, the developer or the reviewer can judge, but let's fix that or those that are, for example, with high score and we agree on. And how would I know if you actually like review it or not? So interestingly, um, I'm, 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 there is an option to check uh, with a checkbox to, uh, to confirm that the developer actually reviewed or at least the reviewer reviewed. I'm actually showing you this not live because I wanted to share with you that you can go to our open source and we share there a lot of uh, news and updates, et cetera. And eventually all of these you can read in our documentation. For example, there's some explanation here how to uh, you know, um, apply how to enable this checkbox in the end of the suggestions. For example, configure it to true. And you can even define your own text. What you like this text to, to look like if you want to define your own, you know, um, uh, uh, processes. Is it mandatory or not, for, for example? Okay, before I go and see more questions, I want to just show you a couple of more examples. Here you saw, for example, a list with scores eight to six, but you might also get uh, a 10, uh, which probably is very, uh, you know, clearly uh, in most cases, high, per high percentages, percentage, uh, something that you want to treat. Um, if you are not clear about some of the suggestions, so you have an explanation at the bottom, okay? Like a suggestion importance, why it was, uh, chosen to be 10, but also you can go uh, to some piece of code that related to the suggestion or not, by the way, and you can ask a question, explain this line, okay? You can go to the tab, uh, you can go to, to the conversation tab or to the file, uh, more accurately to the file, dis file description, file changes tab and, and ask questions, okay? So that's like another way that 
you can work with this work with this flow. And here is an example that you know many many type of categories came up, and also like a high scores. So obviously this was not merged. On, otherwise, it ne needs have to have been you know clean before. So you see like possible bug even, not just possible issue, best practices, performance, etc. One thing that is missing here is that these categories are supposedly generic, generic, right? And maybe we want to personalize them. So that's exactly what I want to show you next. Sorry, uh, let me show you in, in the slide. So what you can actually do is inject, okay, inject in this flow your best practices. You can actually collect, I don't know if you have it written somewhere on your JIRA or whatever, uh, sorry, in your Confluence uh, uh, or, or some document, you need to collect them. And right now you need to put them, you need to put them like as a simple markdown inside the configuration of, of a peer agent. And then uh, these would be considered as part of the review process, okay? So you can like for 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 I don't I don't know like for example for a React Apollo GraphQL based repo you can add a guideline or practice that's saying hey we want always to manage error error handling okay and for something in Go or Python you can have different guidelines if it's front end back end that's really really interesting you can have these org level or repo level again I recommend you to read in our documentation okay you will see there in the documentation. Uh, under improve best practices, etc., that you can define your best best practice, okay, list uh, or markdown, and then you will get a category that is called, for exa example, organization best practice. Okay, that was workflow number number one. Let's move to workflow number two. But before that, let's see if there's uh, are there are any questions. You know, let me. I'll do uh, one more one more, and then do that to have uh, some. Uh, some momentum here. So you will see more, more workflows before. So uh, here is workflow number two, um, classifying pull requests to improve the reviewing process. This, this could be really empowering and critical to personalize uh, your the peer agent to help you um, to navigate and manage your different pull requests. You can create labels that are personalized for your own use case. You can create labels that help you classify risky SQL change, a new API endpoint that you want to route to the security team, a deprecated API. You can create a label related to deprecating uh, a list of APIs you want to deprecate and you will get a, a label for that. You might uh, also try to create a label related to different security concerns that you have that you cannot catch with other tools. And you would be able to explain with our with our tool, with the peer agent, what are those security concerns? For example, giving some uh, so, some example. Okay, so let me go through that. Um, so we have again in the documentation all the explanation. We we have some you know simple uh, examples that are out of the out the shelf off the shelf uh, configuration option. But actually, you can configure yourself. There are a few ways to to do that. Uh, we're showing you can use actually the the, the, the native uh, GitHub uh, label page to do that, or you can do that as part of our configuration uh, in the peer agent. I will use the opportunity to tell you that there is like the main configuration file. Uh, you you will see here quite a lot of config configuration options. They're quite a powerful uh, like defaults, but you're welcome to use the uh, you know the the documentation to see what you can change. And if you want to change, you need to save this file in your root uh, folder, uh, re read documentation how, how to do that. And here you can enable the labeling, but then you need to configure the labeling in either like in a separate configuration file or through the native uh, label file, uh, label page of the GitHub. By the way, we also support other Git platform. We'll talk about it a bit later. What I wanna show you now is are, are a few example. For example, here is an is a pull request that was open in our PR agent, and immediately that person uh, got a label saying, "Hey, there might be a possible security concern. Uh, you might want to manage that." By the way, one of the things you can ask yourself: Why should I get this label now and not get it before I submit the pull request? 
this is a spoiler for other workflows, okay? And then you can have, for example, labels relating to review effort. This sounds like something like, I don't know, naive or simple, but actually it could be very meaningful for you. For example, let's say I'm a tech lead and I want to review some code. I have one hour. If I see a couple or a few of review efforts uh, with level one, I might clean them really quickly and then move to three where otherwise I wouldn't clean them at all. Or I like, you know how it is. You probably, uh, you know, bumped into this problem. And after you start like trusting the review effort labeling, then you see how faster different pull requests are, are being uh, reviewed. And you can tweak this, okay? This label is, uh, you can able, you can choose your own con like uh, definition of what's a review effort. Also, by the way, for example, you can get a label for testing and other other uh, options that I already like uh, discussed. Uh, okay, and last one before reviewing questions. Uh, this is just like what, what I already presented. Uh, a bit of a niche workflow, but could actually be very useful is automatically fetching relevant info from different you know sources of information that are not directly appearing on your pull request. This could be really helpful. For example, CI failures, sometimes like digging into different, uh, you know, failure, failure um, here, this is the case, going into the log and trying to oh. understand what's going on here and where is exactly what I'm looking for could be painstaking. And what we're trying to do here is actually like you can see here uh, where a code PR agent is surfacing those one second here surfacing like a, a a summary with possible even you know action items on on what to do with that and showing where the relevant log is etc okay and there are other commands that you can look for for example we have a command look called similar issues if you open an issue you can ask for similar issue and then get other issues that are might be relevant this could be useful for for many reasons okay I'm stopping here before moving to uh, the next uh, section. Uh, just going to see a bit of some of the Q and A's. Are you planning any certification for Codium like on GitHub? Yeah, <laughs> well, we heard about that and we actually have features related to compliance. So it totally makes sense. Uh, we will look into that. Thank you very, very much for that suggestion. Uh, we have a limited PHP knowledge to set the peer agent to be helpful. Oh, that, that's a great like uh, question. We're thinking about it. We're building our own. It's not something that you, know, you will find right now. We're building our own knowledge bases so you would be able to use them. But meanwhile, what I suggest is that uh, you take a look on some you know best practices. I don't know, maybe Meta has something related to PHP I, and, and uh, I think they have some uh, experience in their past with that and see what you like and you can try to use that Again, you will need to choose some concept that you relevant relevantly think, sorry, that you find most relevant for you. And I suggest that you summarize not more than 10 bullet points or a markdown with no, not more than, you know, like a few paragraphs. You can do more than that, but let AI focus on what you think is more re most relevant for your, your repo. C uh, code suggestions are really opinionated. Uh, as leads, can we customize them? Yes. Uh, right now, what we offer is what I said, what I presented, that um, you can influence the suggestion by implementing your best practice notions. For for example, uh, you can say something like, we don't like camel, camel cake, okay, even something like that. Or um, and, uh, there are other examples, by the way, but uh, for, for example, uh, we don't like documentation, don't suggest documentation, or do suggest documentation in that format, etc., and, and eventually, we are going to introduce more techniques to for you to make sure that things that you didn't like won't appear again, or things that you think should appear will appear. But this is the a roadmap, so I don't want to talk about it uh, too much. Uh, Bitbucket integration, we're being asked here, exist, okay? Uh, and I'll show like in, in a minute. Um, yeah, and let me uh, move move on just to make sure that uh, everyone enjoys uh, further. Uh, slides. Okay. Um, and don't hesitate to send us, find us on Discord. 
we have like a very, uh, we're trying to uh, answer there as soon as we can. We actually grew, grew our team and even DevRel, Dev Advocate, et cetera. So ask us on Discord, on our GitHub, et cetera. We'll try to answer you. But keep asking here in the Q&A. So, you know, I promised quite a lot, right? <laughs> I presented different agents, different workflows. And then in the peer agent, I presented like three workflows with quite, I, I, I really ran over like many of the options. They're quite of interesting workflows and commands uh, that we didn't dive into. And do they work? Do, and, and would that future, how it's going to look like, can AI can actually achieve that? So actually, there are quite a strong signs that saying no. Uh, there, there are a few. Uh, I, I saw like this is one of the reports that I'm not actually saying that I agree with. But I did see other reports that I think have, you know, good uh, authors and with good reputation behind them claiming that maybe LLMs, even the, you know, the best one are not generating high quality code as maybe even lower than the med median developer in, in your organization. So how can you trust AI, you know, doing the old that, that other wonderful task that I'm talking and transforming stuff if the basic, you know, code generation doesn't work? So let me try to talk about that for, for a few minutes and, and explain how we think about it. So this is a very high level architecture of a Gen AI system, like a code completion or a code generation or a code review. And yes, I believe that most of you are developers sitting there and saying, oh, this dude is like a bit weird. This is the highest level architecture for almost anything. Uh, so right, but notice a couple of things that the input is not defined as a point and the output is not defined as a point, but rather as something vague. And I think that's relatively unique for a Gen AI system um, or sorry, product that we're kind of, hey, give please give me like a por porcupine riding on a horse with the moon behind it. And we're quite fine with almost like, and with many options that could be very different on the output. So that's very, I think, unique for a Gen AI system at at this moment, like most of the Gen AI systems and products are defined this way. And when you look, you dive into the code and what's actually happening inside those systems and these products, you will see like something relatively simple. You see some context collection. It could be with a rug or some other option. And then there's one prompt to the model, one inference and the output comes out. And I say the following, if you get, sorry for swearing, shitty code, don't blame the LLM, actually blame the design of this system. Think about, about yourself as a developer, the product manager is coming to you and telling you, hey, this is the input, this is what we want. Give me the solution in five minutes. You'll probably also deliver shitty code, at least I will, I'm sure I will. I'll need to digest a lot of what's happening, you know, uh, try, uh, make a few tries, think about it. Uh, there is a full process we're gonna talk about. And so let's not, Re request the AI to do, you know, give me a solution immediately if we want to have high quality code. There's another option. The first system, we call it system one, and this one we call it system two. I'm referring to Daniel Kahneman, you know, work, uh, for example, the book System Thinking Fast and Slow, Thinking Fast System One, Thinking Slow System Two. And uh, by, by, unfortunately, Daniel Kahneman passed away last, last year. And in this, you know, methodology, we're actually doing a process, like you can think about chain of thought if you're familiar, but a bit more uh, different concept that we call flow engineering that I'm gonna touch, touch uh, on later. It's like an agent of some kind that performs a full thinking process or more than just one inference call. It includes using tools that we talked about, and maybe it could even help us, the developers, understand better or define better what we're looking for, right? If I didn't define well my request to the AI, could it, tell me what's not clear to better define. And then with these two properties of an agent working and thinking and helping me, second thing, helping me to define, maybe I can get the right output with high quality output, okay? So we're saying system to thinking, that's what could enable the uh, future of, of agents, like flows that are really well engineered Okay, that's what could enable, even if the LLM are not perfect, like human or even less, uh, better in some things or worse than others, that concept could work. And let me try to like prove it or, or show evidence to, to that. I'll start with AlphaCodium. So AlphaCodium is a research 
uh, led uh, by uh, one of our principal uh, algo uh, researcher in, in at Codium AI, uh, Tal Rednik. And with Alpha Codium, you can click one button and compete on coding contest. And without doing anything, doing better than the majority of professional developers that are competing on that code, uh, on th these competition, okay? Now, other companies competed there like DeepMind and OpenAI, I'm gonna talk about it, but Alpha Codium did, we did the best because it was applying system two thinking and not system one thinking. Let me explain really quickly because we have other workflows we wanna share. I'm gonna share with you how Alpha Codium works really high level and notice how similar this workflow is to probably how would you would uh, you know, try to solve a problem in, in a coding competition, okay? The coding competition is usually like one you know, file of you know, natural language explanation. It could come with a few examples of how you know, output would look like according to an input. Let's call that public tests, okay? So given a problem, the first thing Alpha Codium does is reflect Let's try to explain to ourselves what what is the, what's the problem about. Then it reflects and and reasons about the public tests about the few examples that were given. Then it tries to generate a few possible solutions. By the way, pseudo code, and then ranking those solution and choosing the best, and then or the one we want to start with, and then considering all of the previous steps. Let's further think. What? How can we generate additional tests to, to further test the 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 certain the specific solution that was chosen? Then finally, generating code. This is the first time that actually code is being generated for the solution, and then iterating with the public test, improving the solution, and eventually using the generated test or generating more to perfectionize the solution and and change it to to work and include edge cases, etc to cover edge cases, et cetera, and then provide a final solution. This flow works really well. I'm gonna talk about it, but first I want to share with you how important it is to have the entire flow. It was critical to have the entire flow, okay? Let's double down, uh, double click uh, and, and, and dive into the part of the testing, okay? So what you see here on the left is the blue, uh, what we see here in this diagram in general, we're trying to explain uh, how using test, how generating test could help us to find all these edge cases to provide the uh, perfect or very good solution. On the left, let's consider one problem of, from the competition and an Oracle solution visualized in blue. Then let's take the, 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 you know, the problem definition together with the few examples and send it to Claude 3.5 or, or GPT-4.0, we will get something that looks quite good to our eyes, but probably doesn't work. But we can use the public test to further iterate, you know, similar to what we present in Alpha Codium to try to perfectionize the solution. But the problem is that there are probably only like a few examples, like a product manager usually giving like a few good flows and not covering everything, right? And then, the solution can actually be optimized for those tests that were given, the example they're given, but not for the edge cases. And then on the right, what you're seeing is the, uh, in, in yellow are additional edge cases that are, was created as a part of the process. You can see here how important it is test generating appropriate test cases uh, uh, you know, for, for, for finding a, a proper solution. Okay, I'm not gonna like dive into how we generate those tests and uh, shameless plug. Generally, code reviewing and testing is our you know our expertise at Codium AI, but this is a very critical uh, notion that's going to repeat. So, uh, on what we see, you see here on the x axis is like how many LLM calls were required to solve one problem. On the y axis, you're seeing how uh, the accuracy, and I can tell you that the accuracy that was achieved with 100 LLM calls is a bit, is like beating the majority of human competitors. That's incredible. By the way, 100, for me, it makes sense. I would say that the steps that I presented before, probably there is like 100 sub-steps sub that what we would do as, as developers. Uh, with Alpha Codium, we also competed against uh, Alpha Code by DeepMind. With their Alpha Code 1, they, they actually needed 1 million LLM calls 
to solve one problem. And then with Alpha Code 2, we released like a few months ago, they actually managed to achieve much better accuracy, but they actually needed to fine tune the model for the specific uh, uh, problem, specific uh, contest. This is problematic. Like you need to train every time. It's very, um, yeah, it's for problematic for many reasons. We have a lot to, to share. I won't double click on that. So I just presented to you how, uh, you know, a flow, which is an agentic flow, can actually do quite well in, on coding. Okay. So the future might be enabled. And to further uh, exemplify that, I'm going to talk about another competition. And the reason, because this competition became a bit more popular uh, in the last couple of uh, months, IBM and, and Devon and Amazon and Alibaba competing there. And the previous one is more like Codium AI, us, DeepMind, OpenAI, uh, and, and Salesforce. So the SW uh, eBanch, uh, we uh is taking, like providing us issues on GitHub and then as a developer, as a contester, con you can take an LLM or a solution, AI empowered like a tool to generate pull requests. And then these pull requests are being checked against unit tests. That's how you qualify a solution or not. Again, notice how tests are the anchor, like enable the future of software development. We believe that code integrity and specifically testing and code reviewing is the fuel for the future intelligent coding system, the, the future of coding, uh, code generation, okay? And you can see that, that rep repeating notion and, and different benchmarks and, and uh, competitions, okay? Now, when I took this screenshot like 10 days ago, Alibaba were on the top. And then when I took it again, like yesterday, I saw actually two new contesters that are doing better. Um, that's really interesting. It's evolving really fast. By the way, if I go back to the screenshot from 10 days ago, you're probably most of you are familiar with Devin. Interestingly, um, if you project Devin results, they competed on not on the light version, uh, but if you project, uh, you know, it's quite easily easily done on, on, on this leaderboard, you will actually find that they're in the 10th place. Okay, that's really interesting. Many of these solutions are, are open source. Okay, let's talk a bit about Alibaba solution very shortly. By the way, again, uh, they were number one just a few days ago, and now they're number three. Basically, what they did here is provided like a system that tried to anal analyze and understand the full code base before trying to solve an issue. That's why you're seeing here like quite a complicated like uh, understanding of the repository, of the file, classes, function, etc. They might overcomplicate things, but generally the notion of being able to solve things by by understanding uh, solving serious problems by understanding code base is probably the right thing to do, and that leads me to the next question. After all of this, what do you think? Did we already see a paradigm shift, you know, in software development or not? Okay, so what I tried to explain in the beginning, and I, I'm starting to wrap up in order to show you a few more flows. What you're starting to understand that I think that right now we are more in the era of Gen 2.0, 2.5 maybe, maybe moving to 3.0. In 2.0, we we didn't change the way we work, maybe like on subtask, we're searching differently, right? We're having more coffee because we we have a tool that helps us convert more 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 uh to have more lines of code written faster, but. In order to really have a paradigm shift, we need AI to integrate into an entire software development life cycle. And let me try to convince you about that in a different way. By the way, I see the Q&A. I just want to get to the end and then answer there. Um, so let me try to convince you that in a different way. Like developers, we love building and writing code, right? But sometimes we're frustrated that we don't have enough time. Either we don't like it or we like it and we don't have enough time to do the testing and pull preparing for a successful pull request. Or, or planning, et cetera. And then like that, like is, uh, or what we're seeing here is like different bottlenecks. If we have AI that help us to write more lines of code, we're still just moving the bottleneck toward the testing and pull request review, et cetera. We can't avoid these steps because low quality code is a trillion dollar problem. Okay, like it's a huge problem for, for each one of us. How Tell me uh, with, with a, a hand on your heart, how much? How many of your tasks, dev tasks in the new sprint is solving bugs or solving issues from previous sprint? 
So that's the problem. So if we want to really like boost our productivity, not by 10%, by 100% or more, we need to integrate AI in all of these. And that's why we have various tools at Coding AI, for example, the peer agent that I did just uh, talked about and uh, the Codiumate that I'm going to show in a, in a few minutes. Having said that, you know, having those separated tools like working for us, maybe it's not enough. Maybe we need like some something smarter. We need like some smart collective context. Uh, I just gave a talk and a venture beat conference like uh, uh, twelve hours ago or so, and this is one of the just one image that I took that actually the notion like this notion was very strong yesterday that basically to develop the next generation of AI empowered tools, we need like to have very powerful smart context, okay, and that where uh, like exactly falls in the right place for me to announce on Coding AI Enterprise platform. It's a code integrity platform that we announced just today. Uh, it's a platform that includes various tools from the ID agent that's integrated into your IDE, from the peer agent that is integrated into your Git. We also have the cover agent. We have our models. You can use other models as well. We have an insight agent that you know, summarizes the value reporting of how different agent reports, but with additional information. And related to what I described just previously, there is a controller in the middle that indexes the code base. It could be 10 repos, it could be 10,000. We have Fortune 100 companies using uh, our tool with tens of thousands of repos. Of course, it's better to choose uh, golden repos out of them and uh, index mostly them or relate mostly to that. But in general, uh, it could enable big organization as well. And there is also like, um, let's say a shared best practices, um, like uh, instance that helps you use and personalize your own best practices, for example, influence the PR agent like I presented in, in the beginning, okay? And now with that, I wanna uh, talk a bit about the first, the fourth uh, workflow, uh, which uses Codimate, okay? This workflow is about how to work with legacy code, okay? So first uh, thing, the simple like flow is indexing locally, asking your uh, asking question about your code, it's legacy so you don't remember, then generating tests, and then like improving the existing test and refactoring it, and then you're ready to write new code, right? But when you meet legacy code, you first need to be acquainted with it and, and you know, hold it strongly with some test and only then you can you can change it. The interesting thing is that when you do that, you can also consider as part of the question and answering and understanding the code, your entire uh, organization uh, uh, works uh, code base, okay? So I, I did like uh, uh, try before and verify that, that, you know, that I have in case I have a Wi-Fi issue, et cetera, but I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try a uh, live um, a couple of those questions. I hope I won't have like the a blue uh, blue screen. So the first thing is like I'm I'm showing you now the the cover agent uh, repo, okay. And the first thing I I can do, by the way, I can locally index the uh, the entire uh, repo, okay. What you see here is now indexing, and that appears now in the codiumate appears now here on on the bottom. But actually, because this specific repo is already indexed remotely, that, then I don't need it. And I can say, please explain uh, explain cover agent, okay? Oh, of course it happened. Uh, yeah, I should have thought about it uh, and I did. I'll check uh, later uh, what, what's going on. So what you can see uh, here is that I asked just before uh, we started, about uh, this question exactly. And what I did ask, please explain cover agent. And you see the reference that are coming from cover agent and also the, the internal ones. And there are different parts of the explanation, quite, quite an elaborated uh, uh, one uh, because the cover agent has a, a few, you know, a structure that includes a runner and a coverage parser and uh, et cetera. Re really wonderful. And, and, and then the next thing I wanted to, that, that if I read that, it'd probably make me acquainted with the with the code base quite quite well. The next thing I wanted to ask, uh, what about a good testing strategy for for cover agent? Okay, and what uh, I did, uh, what I got here 
for example, um, and by the way, again, again, here the indexing uh, is happening, uh, referencing uh, to where you know additional context is, is is being taken from. Okay, I can show you. Okay, right. Uh, so uh, I was suggested with a couple of unit tests, um, and then I was suggested of different type of integration tests and how to do that, end-to-end -end testing, etc. And the next thing I can do is take a look on one of the suggestions that I was giving. I was given a suggestion to validate a duplicate test file, okay? So what I did here is basically, okay, I went to the, I chose current file, duplicate file, called the quick test, and I got I got these results, okay? And the first thing that happens, I get some, you know, happy pass, edge cases, et cetera. I can go into the chat and ask for additional, ask for additional uh, test, or I can use other commands like the test suite to, to generate many more commands, okay? Uh, by the way, the some of some of our um, you know commands are not like native chat interfaces. They actually open advanced interfaces to uh, because there's uh, advanced features there. Um, and I, I re really recommend you, for example, checking out the test suite command that calculates different behaviors of your code and accordingly for each behavior and even sub behavior you can generate different different tests, okay? And then eventually, finally, after uh, you generated a lot of tests and you run them and they're good for you, maybe you want to improve the code, right? Um, we have also an imp improve command. Uh, let me see if I run it already. You have, we have an improve command that is also have like a, a dedicated uh, uh, user interface. Meanwhile, I'll show you that you see that not only we got back different behaviors, but also sub behaviors. And now for each one of them, we can generate a test uh, according to our will and what we think is correct. Like you can see the, the improve generated a, a list of suggestions. I can choose, I can see the explanation. I can choose a few of them that I want to apply and then I can prepare the code changes. That helps me to uh, you know, get acquainted and, and get ready to generate new code with legacy code. And then the next thing that you can do is actually write new code. But you don't have to do that in the traditional way where you only uh, use a code, simple code completion. With Codeumate, you can actually prepare a plan. And then according to the plan, the code completion would load different parts of the plan into the context. And when you will try to you know, autocomplete, it will feel magical because it will take part of the plan and put it in the autocomplete, okay? Uh, just in case I wouldn't have enough time, uh, I, I decided uh, not to show a live demo. What you can see here quickly is that uh, in this video, um, the narrator is showing how he is collecting different parts, or, you know, different contexts. You can either you know, call index the entire code base, or you can index specific parts that you think the implementation needs to go into. And after you collected all the repo context or the specific context, you describe the feature. And after, uh, after that, you're gonna get a plan. And this plan, you know, it, uh, performs a flow that tries to apply best practices So it will help you verify that you if, you, if you have in other parts of your code, if you have other parts in your code that, for example, doing analytics, it will make sure you didn't forget the analytics. I'm talking about like real stuff that we're dog fooding as well. Uh, if you, uh, you know, need to do error handling or things like that, it will be part of the plan that sometimes you forget, but also the plan will try to create for you a plan that is more easily testable. So that's like an advantage of, you know, thinking together with an AI how to plan. And then you load that plan into with a click of a button into your context and, and generate code with, with a plan, okay? Now, the last thing, the last flow is actually preparing for, pull, pull, uh, for a proper pull request or a high quality pull request, okay? Think about it. I presented you the peer agent flow in the beginning where it actually helps us you know, at the last gateway before merging the code, verifying it's high quality. But why not doing that already uh, in the IDE? 
So that's why in the Cody mate, we suggest the following flow. Start by calling the issue command. It's quite similar to the issues that you will get later in the peer agent, but not exactly. Then recap and try to understand like what actually did you implement? You know, get another eyes, another eyeball, uh, artificial one looking at your code and telling you what, what actually implemented. You can use that as part of your pull request description. You don't need to wait for later on. By the way, we also have like an automatic commit message. And then let's have a proper review and, and, uh, and a proper description. And eventually let's not forget to update a change log. All of these are commands in Codiumate that you can apply. Uh, and, and that's like the, the, the sixth workflow that will help you really boost your pull request creation. When we ask some of our Fortune 100 clients, some of them said that this workflow is their favorite because they feel that they're getting much better pull requests uh, being reviewed by, by their colleagues. Great. We're almost at the end. Uh, I want to show you one more thing and then I'll look on the Q&A. Let's say you want to build your own agent, okay? Uh, you know, Codium AI or other companies, amazing companies are not covering your demand. You want to build your own. So first of all, I really recommend uh, to look at uh, Microsoft Autogen. It's actually less focused on developers and you know software development, but it has like cool concept there. So at least try, read it and try it. That's my recommendation. And then they're in the process of developing something more related to developers. It's you know it's not sure it's there yet, but again, if you want to do it yourself, I really recommend reading the Autodev. And finally. Uh, go try, uh, I'm not saying it will be proper, you know, do-it-yourself agent with these frameworks, but at least something I, I recommend trying and playing a bit, the long chain and Lama index and talk to agent ops. They're seeing a lot of agents out there in production. So they're very knowledgeable what works and what not. And of course, shameless plug, but actually uh, I think it's, it's a good one. Um, the peer agent, at least a big portion of it, is open source uh, and it's very mature product. The cover agent and alpha are doing pretty well and increasing code coverage in, in, in a semi-agentic uh, way. So that's my, my final recommendation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this very intensive workshop I, uh, webinar. I tried to present many things. To recap, we talked about the fact that what we're doing now is having, you know, as software developer, we are we shifted from Gen 1.0 to Gen 2.0 of software development, where we're having assistance, and we're now in a transformation to 3.0, where we're seeing agents being incorporated into our software development throughout the entire software development lifecycle. We talked about the importance of testing and code reviewing as you know, and 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 um, let's say like a term that we call code integrity as a fuel, as an enabler for the next generation of code generation and, and intelligent coding platform in, in general. I presented a few evidence to that. Uh, we presented like that what we're gonna see in the future is a full platform. Uh, for example, as Codium AI, that's already in production and uh, various companies. And today we're opening it, enabling anyone that wants to, you know, any enterprise that wants to try it. Of course, we have a free and Teams version it has less features, unfortunately. We're pushing more and more features uh, to to, uh, to the left. And uh, yeah, and we talked about, you know, the option to do it yourself. And uh, I love to to take uh, uh, questions. I think somebody raised uh, a hand. Okay, uh, until, uh, until somebody raised a hand, uh, raise a hand, let me uh, answer a few questions here. Um, <laughs> is Codium AI hiring? We're definitely hiring. Uh, we are uh, mostly looking for experienced uh, uh, seniors, principals, and development, and, and uh, engineering, and and uh, algo. But uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, happy to share my insights. Uh, thank you for compliments. But I'm looking. Okay, someone is uh, Rust. Okay, so we mostly support uh, the major programming languages. Uh, especially those that, you know, there, there is like MIT Apache style uh, per permissive data on, on GitHub. And um, we do have some uh, like languages that programming languages we perform better than others. You can find that on our website. 
we have a table, we need to refresh it. We're doing that soon. For example, we are running some static code analysis and different techniques. Actually, these techniques could be different between programming languages. So some of these techniques perform better than others, um, but uh, but most programming languages are supported. Um, then we your product on your product on your product. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, paradigm shift is there. It will be there in a year or two. I agree with Carol. It's not there yet, but uh, paradigm shift is coming. It's it's not going to be like in a boom. It's going to see like like uh, jumps in uh, ju jumps in productivity as AI is being integrated in more parts of our software development. But once it's like covering, I don't know, maybe it will be eighty percent, ninety percent, one hundred percent of the workload. Then this is when we can actually start, you know, jumping to. Uh, to, to asking AI generating like bigger pieces of code, for for example. Um, how long do you think people will be involved in coding? So what I re recommend for you, it's really hard to answer that question, but what I strongly recommend for you, for everyone, is always try to use a few new tools that are for developer, AI empowered to dev tools. Like try to play with them. Try, don't, don't give up after like trying once. Try to learn how to use them. You know, be that uh, AI uh, native, AI empowered developers evolve with the field, and then I think you will evolve together with the profession. We will see, I believe, in the next five years or, or more, even a higher demand for developers. Just what we're going to see is like developers being able to cover more, you know, doing even more spec generation and going into product, and developers needing to go even deeper because there are some problematic stuff that AI won't be able to to handle. And more of these are going to happen because AI will generate the boilerplates, right? So I think like I would just recommend be AI and empowered uh, developer. Uh, how do you manage with scale with big projects? So I, I gave a hint. We're managing by dividing different types of, of your, let's take a, a certain repo, okay? Take a certain repo. We actually, uh, different types of file, a Swagger file or a regular you know, a code file, we will treat it differently. And we also treat differently different repos, okay? So we actually wrote a blog post uh, about RAG and, and, and some of our system. I recommend uh, reading that. Uh, for Food for Thought, Llama, uh, Meta writes bad React code and unit tests. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's why I said that LLM by itself maybe is not as good as developers if you inference, you know, one inference and ask for code, uh, right? I think that also we wouldn't, as developer, output such a good code. And I tried to explain about that. Yeah, I think there is plenty more questions. And uh, again, join our Discord. Uh, just go to our website, codium.ai, C-O-D-I-U-M.ai. You will see there a Discord server link and we are there to answer any question. Thank you so much for uh, for joining. It was really a pleasure. We have more webinars coming just by the end of this month. We have a webinar about RUG. So some of your question about how we're doing RUG, et cetera, and how we are dealing with different repo and scales uh, is, is next. Have a great day, night, uh, wherever you are around the globe. Thank you so much.